Hello and welcome back to the Rev Real Estate School podcast. My name is Michael Montgomery and today we're joined by Sammy Cohn and we're extremely lucky to be joined by Sammy Cohn, not only because he's an extremely high producing real estate agent in Toronto, but also because he is a very accomplished drummer from one of my favorite bands when I was growing up and still doing it today. Sammy, how are you? Excellent, Michael. We talked off the air. It's good to see you. Full disclosure, we used to work together, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's it's good to see you. Michael and I, you and I would have sort of coaching calls at least once a week, and I learned a lot from you, and I, I, I said it off the off the off air as well. I, I genuinely love your podcast. I'm not just saying that, but it's very, um, it's just very succinct and no BS. You kind of jump right to the point, and, and I always walk away with a couple of little nuggets Awesome. Uh, that, that I use, which is so I would, so I love it. So, but in any event, it is great to see you as well. Thank you for the intro. Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm so lucky to have you here. And yeah, to, to kind of to kind of build upon that. So where Sammy and I originally met, I was doing uh, I was working for a company, the company that he works for, and I was doing training for this company. And Sammy was being onboarded. And during the onboarding period, we just do like our casual get to know one another. And I think we did fun facts. Sammy's fun fact that it was that he was a drummer in a band. And he's like, Oh, you probably won't know too much about it. And I was like, Well, tell me more about it. He's like, Oh, it's a 90s band. And I was like, Oh, my gosh, 90s bands. That's like what I live for. And so He's the drummer for the band The Watchmen, which is a band that A, on my Spotify, I have a ton of Watchmen songs, but B, I grew up listening to this and he's still out there doing it today. So I'd love to actually kick off with on that side of things, Sammy. So how do you how are you balancing your real estate work right now with also this this uh, what I would assume would be pretty time intensive other side I don't even want to call it hustle because it's also mm -hmm. a side, just enjoyment or hobby, mm -hmm. which is uh, drumming for the Watchmen. In all honesty, it, it is a side hustle, Michael. It's 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 not a career move like it once was many years ago. Ninety eight percent of my time is being a full time realtor in Toronto. Uh, the Watchmen uh, had its heyday. Uh, north of 20 years ago, I'm aging myself, but uh, we still play maybe half a dozen shows a year. So that it doesn't really keep me that busy. Uh, I know you probably see my social media and I'm out there and there's this appearance that, that we're busy. But really, the truth is we're doing usually between about maybe seven or eight shows a year, festival season. There's a huge appetite out there for nostalgia for old timers like myself. <laughs> Me too. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because some people, they, they, they always want to know where's that through line between being a drummer in a rock band and selling houses. Mm -hmm. and, and I can understand why that might seem a bit odd, but that business that I had and still have with three people that I grew up with, from Winnipeg, the Watchman, that was a, a, an entrepreneurial self-employment situation where we were pushing things forward every day with the work that we were doing and building a fan base brick by brick. And uh, there's a lot of fundamental things that I did back then that I still do in my business today. So there's more of a direct link than, than some people might think. That's a really good point, actually, because as a, as a band, you're also marketing yourself. As a real estate agent, you're marketing yourself. There's a lot of similarities there. But what I guess, what was the moment when you were, you, you were drumming and you were doing this full time that then made you want to move into real estate specifically? Well, it wasn't a direct jump. When I sort of left the band years ago and uh, I had sit, hit sort of a, an impact pass a bit of a crossroads i'd recently gotten married i was i had literally been living out of a suitcase for about 10 or 11 years traveling all over canada us australia europe i mean it was wonderful but it was also exhausting and really not really sustainable so i started off with some sort of fairly entry level sales positions i worked for an alternative weekly a newspaper in Toronto, very well respected alternative weekly, an eat what you kill commission based environment that was really a lot of good lessons in time management and prospecting, cold calling. Uh, and that led to a bit more serious work with a couple of tech companies that ended up in Canada with head office. I, I did a time for a couple of years at Twitter Canada. So as my sales positions got more sophisticated, I started to get more sophisticated too with learning different processes, notably with Twitter, because I think when you have, I, I think we've talked about this, they ran their sales team like an army there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like every level of, of pipeline from the top of the, of the funnel 
to rapport building, to needs analysis, to get the meeting, you know, deliver at the meeting, close it, like just everything. And they had somebody who worked at every sort of layer. And if there's any sort of holes within that process, we would try to refine that. So amazing learnings as far as running a business, because uh, I had a territory, I worked there. And that led to, this is kind of the truncated version that led to me getting my license ultimately, because I thought if I'm going to sell and I do feel like I have a bit of a knack for this, why don't I sell houses? And um, I know that a lot of people often say this is exclusively a people business and you've got to be out, you know, somewhat outgoing and you've got to know how to work with people. And it's certainly that is foundational to a real estate business, but there's also sales shops involved. Yeah. Yeah. I, I so, totally agree. And let's, yeah. let, let's dive into that a little bit further, because I think there is kind of this this concept of real estate agents aren't necessarily salespeople. They are a different type of salespeople, but we still have to sell our services ultimately. So when you say that you, you had a knack for selling, Mm -hmm. What are some of the skill sets and how did you build them when it came to mm -hmm. your sales skills? Well, it, it really started to get refined when I started working as a, as a professional sales representative. Because uh, I had a lot of the systems and software in place at these companies I worked with. But now I have a lot of systems in place with CRM. I, I've got two CRMs I'm running for different reasons. I know that's sort of counterintuitive to what a CRM is, but, uh, you know, it's kind of boring as to why I do that, but I need two CRMs. I, I do a online lead acquisition and I, I pay for pay-per-click leads uh, as one of the things I do to, to acquire business. I have a lot of reminders uh, and information in place within my CRM, just in terms of anniversaries and closing dates. I was sending out texts this morning, about 20 of them with Valentine's Day messages to previous clients. I mean, I, I feel like there's three things I, I, I do to sort of build my business. One is work with the, the sphere that I have, the sphere of support, not not the sphere of influence, but the sphere of support. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, the, 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 what differentiates the two. Sphere of influence is that list of a thousand people that you start, you look at your phone, you put them on an Excel file and you start in the business. It's your sphere of influence. I read a book not long ago and I can't remember the name of it, unfortunately, how to be a great real estate agent or something. And he talked about the sphere of support. And just in summary, he talked about that group of maybe a hundred people who will advocate for you, who will take your call at any time, who will refer business to you, just like a really, really important group of people who you should be sort of communicating with on a very, very frequent basis with intelligence in terms of their house or the purchase that they made or the house that they sold. And Often people will say, well, I don't feel comfortable asking these people for business. It's not, if you don't feel comfortable, they shouldn't be on that list. Like I'm talking about really sort of kindred, sort of um, not spirits, ki kin kindred, kindred support system. But working with my past fear, online lead acquisition, and then social media, I try to sort of just do the best I can with those particular three pillars. I don't even remember the question you asked me, Michael, to be honest. No, no, no. But I'm actually, you're actually touching on exactly where we're going with this is how you're generating business today. And so I heard these three things which you just mentioned. You have yeah. your sphere, you have your online lead gen. What was the third one, sorry? My social media. Social media, yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's kind of break those down in particular. Let's start with the sphere of support. And you mentioned the fact that these people are people that you're asking for business. You're asking yeah. them for business. Yes. So how are you approaching that conversation? How are you actually asking them in a way that doesn't necessarily feel like you're hounding them? Yeah. You know what? When I feel like I'm hounding people or if I'm trying to sell somebody on something, I really pull back on that. And, and I'll even say it. I had somebody, I was working with a buyer. I'll answer your question in a second. I was working with a buyer a few days ago and they're new buyers and they're pretty green. They're trusting me a lot, which I really appreciate. And I was trying to con effectively convince them to offer on this house. It, house. it ticked off all the boxes for them. They were just getting a little bit of, of pre-offer fear. I yep. suppose. And I caught myself just kind of reminding them of everything it, it, it provided and how it was a great area and it's within the price range they're looking for and it's a great house. And I, and I just stopped and I said, you know what, guys, I'm not here to convince you of anything. That's not my job. I'm here to be a conduit between you and, and this, this particular listing agent and get you a great deal. But really, this is a decision you have to make. I can give you all the information that you want, but I, I'm not here to sell you. I mean, that, that's just... And I pulled back on that. So ask me again. What's the question? <laughs> yeah, asking. Well, no, I think I think that's, oh, yeah, I you, think that's actually. Sorry, you asked me about. You, sorry, Michael. You asked me about in a meaningful way. How do I speak to previous clients in my sphere of support? 
about, yeah. about, about business. So it's a tough question because there's a real fine line between being persistent and being a pain in the ass. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want is to be that guy where I walk into a room and everybody runs in the other direction because I'm handing out business cards. You know, I just, I, I have a real allergy to that. But if there's people on this list who trust you, who you've done good work with, who you've kept in touch with in a meaningful way, not a text every month saying, do you have anybody looking to buy or sell? Valuable things, whether it be an alert showing what sold on their house recently. I've got every one of my clients in on MLS and, and a street alert for them. And in my morning, I get 10 emails and I flip them to my buyers. They look what just sold on your street or look what just popped up in your street. It could not be easier. And, and you don't them. automate it. So they come to you first and they then you send They come to me first yeah. so I can vet it yeah. because th there are certain things that I just don't feel is going to be valuable. But I, I just, when I have a minute, I'll just say, oh, I'll, I'm going to throw this person into MLS. I'm going to put their street on there. And, and if something pops up, I know it'd be of interest. Who's not interested in seeing what's selling on their street? So those are, those are the types of people who I provide that kind of white glove service to. And to answer your question directly, Michael, I have, it's in my inbox. I, I put together an email that sort of just says I, something along the lines of, and I'm summarizing, I know we had a great experience together. Uh, I still think about that great house you bought. My business is built on referrals. I would be very grateful if you could let me know if family or friends or if anybody might benefit by my services. You always get a response, not right now, whatever, but um, you have to ask. You, you have to, it's, it's the fear is asking, but what's the worst thing can happen? Yeah, ultimately, they, well, the, the, I would say the worst thing that could happen would say, no, I'm not going to do that. But I, I want to know how many times you've asked and somebody has said no, Sammy. I mean, it's rare that they say yes. I, I'm, I'm a relatively new in the business. I've been doing this for about five years. I got my license about 12 years ago. And I and then that, and that when I first got my license, I, I did it part time. And then I worked at Twitter. And so my license was on ice for a while. So it's really only been five years. But I feel like I've gotten a lot done in five years. But to answer your question... A lot of them say no. They don't say no. They just say, you know, nice to hear from you. Nobody really comes to mind. You know, sometimes I'll get a lot of people bought recently, whatever. It's, point is, nothing to lose. Why? why yeah, but, but they're not actually like rejecting you. They're just saying, oh, nobody comes to mind right now. And I think a lot of times what our fear is, is that they're going to have some like aggressive rejection where they're going to like attack us. And that's never the case. They like oftentimes they're gonna say, oh, I can't think of anybody right now. But now at least you've planted the seed, right? Now at least they know. And a lot of times people just, are, they don't even know that you're open to referrals. Like sometimes I'll get a client that reaches out and says, hey, I know you're super busy. Would you be willing to help my friend buy a house? And it's like, they're almost inconveniencing us by asking. And so whenever that happens, I'm always like, oh, I need to do a better job of letting people know that we're open to referrals. Yeah. So that's how our yeah. business is ran, exactly how you phrase it. As long as it's asked in a respectful way, there's no good reason why it shouldn't happen probably a couple of times a year with a specific list of people. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And then, so you also mentioned the uh, the online lead side. So what is working for you when it comes to online leads? Are you doing Facebook? Are you doing Google? And, and what seems to be performing best for you? For me personally, I have found that Google pay-per-click works the best, but it's it's kind of relative. I mean, make no mistake, the online lead world is is a tough one with a very, very low conversion rate. But as part of the business that I run, good systems and good habits are paramount for me. So I have time blocked every morning where I call these leads that I get. I spend a certain amount and I get a number of people looking to either lease or to buy. That's usually what it is. It's normally not sellers. And uh, that's usually people who are searching on Google. I find Facebook for me, they made some changes to their algorithm not long ago that really prevented me from feeling like I was getting out beyond just reaching other realtors. The targeting is such that you're going to end up just kind of spamming your friends to to tell you the truth, that's kind of the experience I had. So at least there's a little bit of intent with Google Leads, somebody searching for a house or a specific property. It's low intent. These are long tail, long term leads, but I've done enough in terms of conversion to warrant the expenditure. I, I, I initially, when I first started, I thought, oh my God, that seems just crazy to, to be doing online leads. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. Strangers, whatever. My phone doesn't ring off the hook. It's just one more thing I feel I need to do to build a sustainable business. And yeah. a lot of things that you've talked about in your podcast is the time blocking and, and habits and doing things little by little by little by little and getting to sort of an end result. It's gotten to the point where I, I almost enjoy it. I enjoy yeah. making these calls. I've got, I don't have a script, but I have something in my mind to try to ask questions. There's really two things I need to find out in a first call if there's intent 
if there's budget, if there's timeline, and then you kind of work from there. You, you just need a little spark. Yep. And then you can kind of go from there. So I, I enjoy online leads. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with them because sometimes I'll just want to throw my computer out the window. Um, <laughs> you caught me on a good day. I've ha- had a couple of good calls this morning. I'm meeting somebody tomorrow to see a place and it's it's roulette, but it's, it's what we need to do. I've said it before. I don't have plan B. I've got plan A and plan B is to kill it with plan A. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> That's the deal. Well, you know what I really like that you said that you've learned to love it. And I've heard that so many times. I've even seen it in my own business where certain things that I disliked, which was like whenever I was calling somebody who was a relatively cold lead, initially I hated that. Probably mm. very similar to you. But what you'll learn is you actually learn to love it. And you you learn to kind of love the chase in a sense, but you also learn to love the conversations. And initially we feel very self-conscious. We kind of try to make sure our scripts are perfect. But eventually yeah. the more of these ha- you have, the more the organic conversation starts to just flow. Yeah. And it actually becomes quite an enjoyable source of leads. But yes, you're right. I think anybody coming into this with the expectation that you're going to throw 200 bucks at an ad and you're going to sell three homes is you're, you're going to be setting yourself up for failure. So we have to understand the long, the long-term nature of this. So with that, how are you continuing to maintain that relationship? If they're not looking to buy for the next one year, how do you end up maintaining that relationship over time? You know, that's the tricky thing because if you've had a discovery call and they've been seeing places for a few months, where, where do you go from there? And that's where it's sort of, it's tricky. You don't want to be a pain. And believe me, I've got people who I think have probably blocked my number at this point and aren't happy to hear from me. Like I said, you have to walk that fine line. These online leads, they're not loyal. Uh, This is not about loyalty. This is about finding uh, an agent who could help them meet their needs in in, in sort of an immediate way. A lot of times I have to reintroduce myself, remind them, check your inbox for my name, etc. You just have to get past kind of a little bit of a barrier. You're right that those first few moments can be difficult when you're sort of asking questions. And of course, these people have their back up against the wall. How many times have you answered the phone, first of all, from somebody whose name you don't recognize? Yeah. And if it is somebody whose name you don't recognize and they start trying to sell you on something, click, you know, yeah. it's, you've got two seconds. You can't take it personally. That, that, that's the biggest rule. I mean, I've had people hang up on me, tell me to F off. I mean, it doesn't feel good, but the feeling of, of how, just how enjoyable and how productive it, it, it can get if you've got many people sort of at various stages of development, there's a real sense of accomplishment there that really outweighs any of that stuff that that I think creates fear in people to do it in the first place. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And it's also just a, it, it's a skill set thing too. We just improve our ability to communicate and ask questions. And if we're just dealing with our sphere and repeat, there's nothing wrong with that. That's where, you know, most of all of our business is going to come from. Yeah. But that conversation is a little bit easier. So it's when it's a little bit trickier, we tend to actually improve our skill set because we have to be a little bit more clear with how we're communicating and how we're asking questions. Well, yeah, it, it's all about the questions. I mean, I, I, I gave you an example earlier of somebody I spoke to who was wanted me to move to their brokerage. And I don't think he asked me any questions. And and I wasn't testing him. I just felt like it just was not a very meaningful conversation. I don't know what he learned from me. And I didn't get much out of it. I didn't feel any rapport. I mean, it's very, very hard to do. But the essence of online leads and what is foundational to being successful in that arena is not being tied to the outcome, is not thinking on the phone, how am I going to close this person? It's just little incremental steps. Yeah. You set the expectation. Can I call you in a month if and if you're not looking now? Because the, the stock answer is I'm just browsing. Yeah. So can I send you stuff? Can I call you in a month? I mean, get the meeting. That's the next step. If you're sitting there on the phone waiting to go and meet somebody at a house so you can sign some paperwork to do a buy, you're going to be very frustrated. So it's those little sort of little um, small victories. Yeah, I love that. You're just kind of, you're, and we, we talk about this quite frequently too, is just like, you're not ever closing somebody. You're just kind of moving somebody from one step to the next. And sometimes these are baby steps. And as long as we're progressing, that's a successful transaction. Eventually you reach the final destination. But oftentimes in real estate, we just skip all of these steps. How do we get the buyer into our car and go show them homes? Well, it's not that. Like first we have to get to the point of building rapport and we have to also display that we 
understand the market conditions. And right. so, but I also really liked your comment on how the online lead, when you're dealing with the online lead, they are more results focused. Like they're not necessarily looking for a real estate agent to be friends with. They're looking for something like a certain property type and a price point. So we have to deliver that to them as well. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm going to see a place tomorrow. It's it's a lease. I'm not thrilled with doing lease work, but it's, I, I like to be busy. And if I'm not super busy with buyers or sellers at the moment, I've got a new listing this week. I've got the business, but I still try to stay sharp with, with lease opportunities. The call I had today led to some places we're seeing tomorrow. She wanted to see a specific place. It wasn't time to really do a lot of rapport building on the phone, but we did. It was kind of natural. And then we're going to see some places tomorrow. I sent her the calendar invite. She sees I'm professional. Sent her a link to my website. Here you can put a face to the name. I make some self-deprecating joke about the horrible photo on my website or something. <laughs> and um, and then you kind of take it from there. It gets to the point, Michael, and you probably know this too. You don't even remember where the lead came from. They're not a lead anymore. They're a person. They're a person. They've yeah. got needs. You know, it's, it's like, honestly, sometimes I'm like, boy, I've been working with so-and-so for six months and they were an online lead. You know, they were somebody who ghosted me for two months. Now we're like, I can't get them off uh, out of my car, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, it takes work to get there for sure. Yeah. And it definitely, it definitely pays off. And then the third one, which I, I see all the time out of you is your impressive presence on social media. And I would say the impressive presence is one thing. The other thing that I see from you, Sammy, that is, that, that's really impressive is your level of consistency. So you just, I don't know if maybe you can walk us through this. Do you have a system to how you post on social or how you approach it, but you seem to have very, very consistent approach to posting on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you do that? That's it, one thing that a lot of us struggle with. I enjoy it. I think that's the easiest way to do it consistently. It's not something I do begrudgingly because it makes me feel like I'm, I'm doing something to push the yardsticks forward a little bit. I'm out there following a lot of other realtors on TikTok and on Instagram, et cetera, just seeing what content I respond to. I think the days are gone of just the, you know, just sold slideshow, whatever. I mean, granted, I do that. I want to get my product out there, but I just know that it, it's kind of a, a waste of time unless you're doing it two, three times a week. I also try to just provide something valuable in terms of some, some messaging about market statistics or interest rates or whatever. I mean, make no mistake. I, I, and I've said this before, market statistics is enough to cure insomnia. Believe me, I, 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 <laughs> I there's nothing more dull than seeing somebody who's standing there talking about, you know, January statistics. I mean, I glance at that stuff. I'm in the business. It's, it's just the, the, the most unsexy thing you could be talking about online. And I guess my point is, being boring is is the worst thing that you can do. I'm, I'm experimenting with TikTok right now. I know video is mm -hmm. kind of an, an important thing. I'm pushing myself to do it. It's not my comfort to be in front of a camera like that, but I'm, I'm just trying to improve on it. You know, that coupled with the fact that my wife is actually a professional designer, she's given me sort of the templates that mm -hmm. I kind of do a lot of dragging and dropping with, which makes it easy. So it looks professional. That's that. That's the essence of it, right there. Yeah, and then also I would say from what I, what I've really liked in the in the content that I've also really engaged with when it comes from what you're posting is seeing the personality side too. I also like that you're you're not afraid to post the odd drumming photo, right? And post what's going on with the Watchmen and post your next show. And we see your we we see children behind the scenes. We see what you're doing in in your day to day life, and I find that to be extremely engaging as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I probably learned it from you, my friend. You know, you got to sprinkle in that personal. <laughs> content you know it's not it's not uh this big uh sort of grand master plan here i mean social media is sort of here today gone later today as they say you have to just get it it's immediate and you know we've all seen those posts on tiktok where somebody's like stop scrolling stop scrolling you know listen to my message for a second it's it's a jungle out there it but, is you know the the worst thing that we can do as realtors you know just to sort of take the conversation to another area which i think i'm sure you can relate to i feel like as realtors we walk around with so much baggage with the mental game of being a realtor is the hardest thing it's hardest thing for me hardest thing for a lot of colleagues i speak to when times are lean we are barraged with negative information we're given so much in terms of people trying to win business from us with tantalizing opportunities. Can you handle 15 more leads a month? Can you handle 15 closings? Do you know that 80% of realtors quit after their first three years? And I mean, this is so negative. And we hear this noise all the time. What other profession has that hitting them over the head daily? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard enough as it is to try to, to have systems in place and feel like we're running a business as a self-employed entrepreneurial agent, but to be hit up with so much noise all the time is it's tough. So we need to be really thick skinned and resilient to sort of overcome that. How do you combat that personally? And I would say like, even right now, the negativity is probably as high as it's been in years because of rising interest rates and, you know, slowing number of sales and things like that. So how do you combat that kind of cloud of negativity that we hear in the real estate space? It's hard, Michael. I'm not, I, I'm in the trenches too. Yes. I had a great year. I've got clients. I'm busy, but I work every day to acquire new clientele. Door slammed in my face metaphorically all the time. And it's hard. You know, something you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another pat on the back here. Recently, you suggested the uh, effort, success, mm. productivity. Was that, was that it? Or, or the, uh, the ESP. Yeah. The ESP. ESP. Yeah. Effort, success, and what was the, what was the, what was progression? P? Progression. Progression. Yeah. I love that. It, it's writing down what you did yesterday. Uh, where you made an effort and there was some tangible results. What did you succeed at? What is the S? What's the P? Progression. That kind of stuff helps me. Journaling, keeping my mental health in check in terms of my inner, my my self talk. You know, I struggle with that. It's hard, uh, but that's just my personality. It's not real estate per se that causes that. But there's many, many external things in this business that are very, very hard to take. So it's it's a daily thing. So I'm always looking to improve and and take into account tips such as the one you provided me not long ago, ESP. I mean, it's. It's a great thing. You, you said earlier, you appreciated the confidence I brought to the table with clients on Zoom calls. You know, we used to work at a brokerage where a lot of the, the, there was transparency with, with Zoom calls. You know, it's, I saw that and I kind of chuckled to myself. I don't feel that way, but I do know that if I'm prepared, I'll feel that way and I'll feel kind of bulletproof if I know what I can get for somebody's house. And if I feel that there's natural rapport building where two, there's good energy just being passed through, if it, you can feel it. I love those moments. It doesn't happen all the time. And even in person, it's hard to get, get that happening. But the confidence was not, it wasn't confidence. It was just preparation exemplified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would, I would totally agree with that. And just for context for folks, when, when we were working together there, we had this software, it's similar to gong.io, if anybody's heard of that, that basically records the Zoom call. And of course, with the client's consent, and then the Zoom call would be recorded. And then I would review this, the Zoom call and chat with uh, the agent. So in this case, I would be re reviewing one of Sammy's calls. And one thing that just kept jumping out at me, and you may even be noticing this in listening to this, is he has a level of connection conviction to what he's saying. He's also an extremely strong communicator. And so what, what you're saying, which I, which I think is actually a really important point is sometimes you may be giving off the impression of a level of confidence, but are in are internally, maybe we don't feel that. And I oftentimes will feel like that too. Like if you externally watch me, you think, Oh, this guy's got everything together, but internally we don't feel that way. Yeah. Like professional athletes are the, are the same way. And not to compare myself to a professional athlete, cause I'm the complete opposite. Michael, how many real but, estate coaches look like Christian Bale? Okay, well, they're, you're, you're a movie star. <laughs> for Christ's sake. Come on. <laughs> That's with the with the beard and the hair that the needs beard. to be cut. Yeah, the, the, the hair that slim needs to be Christian cut. Bale. The, the yeah, there we go. Bale. There we go. <laughs> but so, would you credit like I guess when it comes to the the confidence side of things, would you credit that to to anything, or is it is it mostly preparation? Do you find the more prepared you are, the more confident you come across? I work at it every day. I, I exercise to kind of yeah. shake off the ghosts and keep myself in shape and my mental health in shape. I, I like I said, I, I, I journal, I keep myself, my negative self-talk under control. It's, it's something I work at all the time in a very, very positive way, because uh, like I said, it's, it's tough. The mental game, I think is the hardest thing about this industry, given the noise and given the uncertainties of the business, it's not for the squeamish, but I, I know that the drive sort of outweighs any risk of me not working really, really hard at this business. I'm, I'm really, I'm sort of a magnet when it comes to learning and going on YouTube. If I'm sitting eating a lunch at work and watching a Tom Ferry video or something, I recently had to do some price adjustments for a house and, and I needed to refine how to communicate that to the seller in a way. And I watched an amazing video that gave the steps and, and now I've got I have it sort of in my toolbox. You know, it's sorry, Mr. Client. I'm having this conversation with lots of people. This is difficult. It, it's not, it's nothing personal. You know, the market, the realtors, and most importantly, the buyers out there have responded. And I think we need to adjust the price of the home. What do you think? End of story. Yeah. 
you know? So, but point being that a month ago, I didn't really have that. So it's a, it's the, the beauty of real estate is that we could always be learning and refining. That goes with sales, I think, in general. Yes, it's, of course, a people business, but it's also a business where learning the fundamentals of selling, you know, Dale Carnegie, you're probably too young for that, you know? Oh, no, I, I, I eat that up. Yeah, I mean that's that's just good stuff. You you take it in and and you learn it and 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 sort of regurgitate it in a way that suits your personality in a non sleazy, meaningful way where you empathize. Empathy is very hard when we've got a commission check dangling on a carrot and we haven't had a closing in three months and we've got a somebody who is wishy washy on the other end. It's very hard not to have commission breath. You know, that's true. you really have to you really have to uh, keep yourself in in check when it comes to that. So, yeah. but just to put a, a bow on your question, it's just about being prepared. Uh, is is how I try to approach uh, my in person meetings for sure. Yeah, that's it's such a good tip, and it's one that I think a lot of times we gloss over and we think, oh yeah, we're prepared. But can we really dig into what we're walking into when it comes into a listing presentation? And the other side to this, which we did just briefly discuss, but I'd like to I'd like to dive deeper into it, is your communication skills, how you're communicating things. Also, just your the vocabulary that you use, like you have a you have a way of communicating that is that's very empathetic. It also is very intelligent in many ways. So if somebody wanted to and, and communication, I think, is like it's at the core of everything that we do in real estate. And you seem to have this mastered. So if somebody wanted to improve their communication, what suggestions would you have for them? Well, I mean, always learning. There's there's a thousands of good sales books out there to sort of learn the tricks of the trade. Of course, questions and, and, and learning how to listen. I'm, I'm always catching myself cutting people off when they're responding to somebody, something I've said, you know, my wife can ready to kill me when it comes to that. I'm not really listening. And it's and it's important. And if you're so wrapped up in your own response, how are you going to properly respond? You have to listen and everybody has a unique sort of situation that you're dealing with. This isn't rocket science. This is kind of like communication skills 101. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, Michael. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't look at myself that way, you know, being a, an effective communicator, I guess, for, for t- north of 20 years, dozens upon dozens of meetings with people uh, who I, I didn't know. And I, I was selling advertising when I first started, earning 10% on everything I sold from everything from like $150 little business card side ad, size ad to a, a full page in a, in a weekly newspaper. And it was getting on the phones and just seeing if people might benefit by some print advertising, going to their business, sitting with them, learning, asking questions, seeing if they use advertising, if they understand advertising, what do they need to do? You know, everybody wants to grow their business, but they don't want to spend on it. So I was just, it was a lot of negotiating and, and it's just kind of a melting pot of, of everything, I guess. I mean, what's interesting and we sort of talked about this at the beginning is I always thought the band was just this thing that I did where um, I had this dream as a teenager to be a, a drummer in a band. And I did that and, and and I hit every mark I wanted to. And then I hit a certain age where it just sort of didn't make sense for me to do that. I didn't want to continue to be a professional musician and live on the road. But that, that just uh, that entrepreneurial work really set the stage for kind of like chapter two for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of things that are jumping out at me. First off, this concept of learning, right? Like we have all of these resources at our disposal and I know it can be overwhelming, especially if you're newer in the industry, even if you're more experienced in the industry, it can be overwhelming all of the skill set that we need to know. Yeah. But breaking it down and, and actually actioning this and learning is, is key. But the other thing is I think your background having a sales background and be and having gone through a number of conversations like you will get better at communication the more that you communicate and i find with communication you yes there's a lot of like mental tricks that you can figure out and things like that but that might be like you know five percent of the equation the remaining 95 percent is talking to more people and the more that mm-hmm. we talk to people the more conversations we have the more questions we ask the better we become at it and you've had a lot of at bats in your previous career and even And even today with online leads and things like that, and the more that we can understand that communication improves, the more we do it, the better we end up there. And, you know, the irony is uh, my favorite thing to do on a Saturday night is sit home with uh, Netflix and, uh, you know, uh, and my PJs, you know, Uh, I I consider myself a kind of a shy person uh, who's not who's not that outgoing, who's my default is that sort of level of comfort. But um, it, 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 you can't be a secret agent. You got to get out there and you have to you have to talk to people. And for me, I get such a buzz out of connecting with somebody on kind of a personal level, especially at, at, 
at, at a meeting like this, this, I keep coming back to this showing I've got for, for tomorrow from somebody who I met online. I, I had a nice conversation with her. I, I'm sure she's Googled me, me by now. And I'm meeting her and her husband at a house. And my style is just no BS. Yeah. I'm just, I, I just, I'm so, I'm so against or, or, or I'm not a fan of walking into a retail store and have somebody just all over me. It'll just turn me off. Who doesn't, re nobody responds well to that. Yeah. So if I, when I'm driving to a meeting, this is another trick that I do. When I'm driving to a meeting, I'll ask myself, and this is harkens back to the work I was doing in tech, where it was very methodical in terms of sales process. I, I, I'm say, I literally say to myself, sometimes out loud, car beside me must think I'm crazy. What do I want to accomplish today? What, what, what's the primary objective? The primary objective is getting them to make an offer on this place. Okay, sure. Secondary objective is gaining some rapport, building some trust, setting some expectations, and going to see more places with them. And of course, if I was to walk away thinking, oh shit, I didn't sell them a house. I mean, I would be, it'd be a world of frustration. But if I could walk away thinking, okay, there was natural rapport. It wasn't BS. I learned about them. I know their dog's name. I know that they've been, they went to school in Washington, whatever. That's a big secondary objective that I've hit right there. And that's going to lead to business. Yeah. So yeah. that that's I I you know I live in my car like most agents. So these are the kind of things that that I think are really important. Not just kind of just you know opening up a, the door of the house and this is the kitchen. I mean you can get a monkey to do that. You know. Yeah. I like that concept though. I'm gonna try that of like speaking to yourself while you're in the car. I think that there's there's a lot of power. Like and, and a lot of times our self talk is negative. I find like just as humans, we naturally tend to gravitate towards negative self talk. So usually what I try to do when that happens is I try to talk to myself versus just listen to myself because you can talk to yourself in a very positive light and change right. your whole your whole trajectory of your day. But if we just kind of listen to our internal dialogue usually that kind of skews more negative. So I, I really like that concept of, and that you also then end up having kind of a North star when you're going into a meeting, right? You know what you're, what you're after. And then, so you can kind of start to gear the conversation and how you're progressing with that in mind, with that gauge. Yeah. I like that. Just guiding yeah. things along and, and just knowing that you, pardon me, you want to just sort of have some next steps in place, especially with, with, because it's just so easy for, for that report to go south and if a lot of time sort of elapses, it kind of dissipates. So it's it's tough, but yeah, there are ways to to refine it. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good strategy. And Sammy, as we're wrapping up here, how can folks reach out to you if potentially they have referrals for folks in uh, in Toronto or just want to connect with you? What are the best What are the best ways to connect? Well, just through my website. Sammy Cohn, K O H N dot com. I'm on all the major socials, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Certainly come find me there and I'd love to connect and answer any questions and we'll go from there. And I'll, I'll link those up in the show notes as well. And if anybody wants to follow somebody who is, who's doing a really good job of social media and being consistent with social media, I think Sammy's a really good follow. And then we're also going to, because we just have to, we also have to link up the Watchmen <laughs> in, uh, in the show notes as well. So if you haven't heard the Watchmen, go and, and check them out and that that is what I like rocked out to all throughout the nineties and early two thousands. And I, I still do. Cause that is like my, th that is my genre of music is exactly what Sammy and his, his friends were creating. So Sammy, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate Michael, it. Michael, my pleasure anytime. And thanks again for all the great content from you as well. You bet.